Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Saturday the 23rd of April. Now, we've long bemoaned the fact on this channel, and, and many of you with us, about the lack of antibody data from the Office for National Statistics failing to differentiate between the antibodies generated by the vaccine and the antibodies generated by natural immunity. Now, they are still not giving us that information, but they've just given us a huge update on the infection survey, where they're actually looking at positive PCR tests. And the results from that, to give you the bottom line of this video, is that as of mid-February, 70% of the population, just over 70% of the population in England, had been naturally infected by SARS coronavirus 2. Now, this probably applies to most European countries. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, probably getting to that level now as well. In the United States, the number of actual infections has probably been higher than that. But that's the figure for England as of mid-February. 70% of people had had, the, had, had, had pos tested positive for the virus. And now, of course, we've had the BA2 surge, so that number's got to be 80-85%, probably getting on for 90% of the population have been exposed to natural infection. And this is probably the main reason that the infections are starting to go down now. And of all those infections... 30% of infections were reinfections. So of the total number of infections, about 40 million of them, 30% of those were reinfections. And this is very positive for um, people developing a degree of immunity, therefore less likely to be severely ill, hospitalised or die if they are reinfected a, a second time or a third time or a fourth time or whatever it happens to be. And each time they're reinfected, of course, that's going to carry on boosting their immunity. So that's what this uh, this video is about. If you haven't got time to watch it, that's fine. If you're short of time, just stick around those for, the, for these graphics. Now, the, these are accurate as of the uh, 11th of February. So England, we see that 70% of the population uh, would have tested positive had we tested the whole population. And given that this is based on a sample size of over half a million, this is pretty reliable data. And one thing the Office for National Statistics do know how to do is pick a representative sample. And if you've got a representative sample of over half a million, we can be pretty sure about this. They actually say they're 90% sure that this is an accurate figure or in an accurate range, but I, I would say it's, it's higher than that. They're being conservative. This is, this is very good uh, quality data. So there you go, 90% credibility uh, interval, 70% have had the infection, the natural infection uh, in England. And of course, this is telling us nothing about vaccination status. This is just people that have had the infection because it's determined by repeated PCR testing. It says nothing about vaccination at all. Uh, so that's the figure for England. Uh, the figure for Wales is less, but they started testing later. Uh, again, in Wales, I would assume this is 85% now, the same, as, uh, the same as the rest of the UK. Northern Ireland, slightly higher figures than uh, England. Again, probably not significantly different. But remember, this is only going up to, um, this is actually, actually going up to the 11th of February only. And since then, we've had that huge BA2 surge. Scotland, again, they didn't start collecting the data till the 20th of October, so they missed a lot of the infections in the early wave. So um, pretty important data, really, with massive implications as we move into endemicity that so many of the population are now going to be enjoying this degree of immunity as a result of the natural infection. Natural infection, of course, stimulating the antibodies, but also stimulating the longer lived B and T memory lymphocytes. The B will go on producing the antibodies anytime they're required to. And the T lymphocytes, of course, directly destroying virally infected cells as well as stimulating the B cells to produce the antibodies. So if you're short of time, um, do feel free to skip now. But if not, here's a few details on that. So Office for National Statistics, so it's good data. We know that as far as it goes. That's the headlines, seven in 10 people. Now this data was released yesterday, the 22nd of April, and it covers the 27th of April, 2020. So pretty near the start of the pandemic only up to the 11th of February 2022. Now, since then, as we've said, there's been a huge, uh, so that, that would be, there was an increase with the early Omicron, but then we got this huge increase because of the BA2. And I've estimated that if there was 100,000 infections a day, 
um, as a result of um, Omicron BA2 especially since this time, since the 11th of February. That alone is another 6 million uh, active uh, cases of people that have been infected. So we know the number is way higher than this now. So 70% there, the real number now is probably about 85, 90%. But as of the 11th of February, 70.7% of England to have had a COVID-19 infection, sars coronavirus 2 The estimated percentage of the community population, now the Office for National Statistics, do not cover those in hospitals, care homes, or other institutional settings. This is just a household home survey. So again, we see that these are minimum figures, minimum figures. The vast majority of the population now, as of the 23rd of April this today, um, have, have been infected naturally. They've had the infection, um, which is, is, is great news for long uh, widespread immunity. Uh, now, that COVID-19, what that had COVID-19 was, there's the figures for the home countries. As we say, these are probably typical for European countries. The United States, uh, ironically, because the... Uh, the restrictive measures to slow down the infection in the United States were so, um, uh, let, let's say, haphazardly or, or uh, uh, geographically variably uh, inter, uh, implemented, Im implemented that their, their infection figures, I'm sure, are way higher than this. And this is actually interesting because the United States is not getting the BA2 bounce or not a big BA2 bounce. In fact, it's not really getting a BA2 bounce at the moment. Um, as, as the UK has, probably because there was so much earlier Omicron, Delta and Alpha infection in the States, uh, stimulating individuals' immune systems, of course. Um, so that, that's the figure for uh, Wales, that's the figure 72 for Northern Ireland, 51 for uh, Scotland. But uh, th these are partly explained by the different times. So um, England, uh, this died on the 27th of April, um, Wales, they didn't start till the 30th of June. <clears throat> Northern Ireland, 27th of July, they started in Scotland, didn't start till way back in uh, the 20th of 22nd of September 2020. So that kind of explains that. And uh, as we say, we've now had the BA2 uh, huge increase, so everywhere will have caught up, really, I'm pretty sure. Now, just a little more detail on this. Um, coronavirus COVID-19 infection survey technical article. Now, I haven't seen this published by the ONS before. Now, I'd like to think that uh, this was published in such detail because we've been complaining about it. <laughs> I'm sure it's completely, irre well, it is completely irrelevant to that. We know that. But um, it does answer that question we wanted to know about antibodies, because even though inexplicably, annoyingly, that they're not testing for antibodies, we can infer that all of these people who've had the natural infection will have had uh, antibodies at, well, all, virtually all, will have had the antibodies at some period in time. Now, the ones who had the infection earlier on, of course, the, the antibodies could have waned and they'll be below the detectable threshold now. So again, the level of antibodies would be at minimum, whereas this is actually looking at the number of infections, which um, is, is, is really good, especially as we see how they do it. So um, where am I here? There we go. Do, do check on the links for yourself. Um, excellent uh, materials. Number of people who have had at least one episode. And as we said, 30% had the infection twice. Uh, episodes of uh, coronavirus. That's when the data spans. Now, this number here that they're testing, 535,116. This is a superb sample size. And it's arbitrarily, not arbitrary, but ran no, it's not arbitrary, not arbitrary. It's randomly selected across the UK. And this random means they, they, this is an accurate representation. It's people from age two and upwards <clears throat> that they tested repeatedly, uh, living in private households. So as we said, not hospitals, not institutional settings. So it represents minimum uh, numbers. Each participant was uh, regularly tested during the duration of the study. Now with other studies, uh, the REACT study, for example, they pick a new sample every time they do the study. Whereas here, it's the same people getting repeatedly, mostly monthly, repeatedly tested over a period of time for PCR tests. That means it's picking up reinfections, whether they're symptomatic or not. So these aren't people that think, oh, I've got a bit of a cold or I don't feel well today. Um, I'll go and get tested. No, 
th th these were tested whether they were symptomatic or not. So it's picking up all the infections. Now, it doesn't tell us how many were symptomatic and how many weren't, unfortunately. That would be really interesting to know. I think we can assume about 40% were asymptomatic. But it doesn't actually tell us that. So that 40% is a bit of a guess. Um, so P PCR reactions. And, and uh, direct quote, we take all positive and negative tests in the survey and apply statistical modelling techniques, which they are very good at, uh, to estimate the number of people who have had COVID-19 in the population. So good stuff. So the Office for National Statistics is absolutely great at doing the detail. The, the only thing we've got about is, is the our, we, we question them about the original things that they look for. But once they're given the brief, they'll trot off and do that as well as anyone in the world. So uh, very happy with this quality of data. Each of the four uh, UK nations for the duration of the surgery. Daily prevalence, in, uh, daily prevalence and incidence estimated, uh, even though it was only one month, have got over half a million people to look at. The incidence, that's the number of new cases estimated from the prevalence, because if you know how long it's going to last for, you can work back to the number of new cases. Uh, we do this using both positive and negative swab results. So, um, OK, it's an expensive survey, but it's also a very good one. Let's just look at a little more uh, information on this. Um, positivity prevalence from first infection episodes. Right, a new positive test occurs 120 days or more after an individual's first positive test. So 120 day gap to indicate reinfections. This is talking about reinfections now. And their most recent prior test was negative. OK, so the tested positive, the tested negative, then if the test positive again, 120 day gap, that's a reinfection. Or the last positive test had been followed by four consecutive negative tests. So that accounts for much shorter time periods. So again, they're accurately able to um, estimate which infections are reinfections. It's not just that the virus is uh, still being excreted by the respiratory tract and is picked up by the remarkably sensitive PCR testing. And of course, they did take into account the PCR cycles as well. So the actual data collecting as well as the data analysis here was well, very well done. Um, Duration of, uh, duration of the testing positive varies from person to person, of course. They took that into account. Incidence and duration can be used to give the prevalence. So they can argue from the prevalence to the incidence and from the incidence to the prevalence, which is, uh, again, the, the, again you, using good statistical techniques to do this. Right, reinfections. Um, reinfections. Uh, we uh, retest the same people regardless of whether they have symptoms. So... They're going to detect asymptomatic as well as symptomatic reinfections. We can identify both infections and reinfections using the criteria we've already looked at. And our data includes asymptomatic cases, which is good. Because if someone's had the infection symptomatically and then they get reinfected asymptomatically, I believe that's still going to reinforce the person's immunity. Uh, to the SARS coronavirus 2, even if that infection was symptomatic. Now, some data shows that symptomatic infections are giving a higher level of immunity, but even an asymptomatic reinfection is going to give some level of immunity, particularly to the mucosal compartment, which is so important to protect the nose, the upper airways and the lungs from infection, because we have this idea of systemic immunity in the whole body and the mucosal immunity as well. And that will be stimulated to some extent. We don't know the exact amount, but by to some extent, by uh, even asymptomatic reinfection. Uh, now, the actual the actually Office of National Statistics don't actually give the the number. They leave that to uh, Cambridge University modelling, who are using ONS data. So really, this is a collaboration between Cambridge University and the Office for National Statistics. 20th of February, so going right back, 20th, 20th, that really was the, first, the very start of the pandemic, really, isn't it? Uh, 20, 20th of February, at least in the UK, 20th, 20th of February 2020 to the 10th of February uh, 2022. Again, out of date, of course. Estimates uh, 40.2 million, 40 million people had COVID-19 in England. I'm happy to add 10 million to that now. Um, I, I would have 
I would have thought so because I've had this huge uh, Omicron spike. So I would believe about 50 million people have now had the infection, the sizable majority of the population. And 30% of all infections are reinfections. So of all the infections, 30% are reinfections. Uh, now, unfortunately, it doesn't tell us that these reinfections were milder. But I'm sure the vast majority of them, of course, would be, especially if the original infection was Delta and then they were reinfected with Omicron. It doesn't tell us that, but it does tell us that 30% of all infections were reinfections. But of course, we know that that's gone up dramatically in the, uh, in the Omicron era, of course. Because remember this, again, direct quote, the risk of reinfection was approximately 10 times higher in the period when Omicron variants were most common compared to the Delta. So the vast majority of these reinfections will have occurred in Omicron periods of time. And of course, we know that that uh, Omicron is associated with significant immune escape, whether the original immunity came from the vaccine or whether the original immunity came from the natural uh, infection. Um, that's all I want to say about that, really. Um, I just want to but what, what, what we can some thing that concerns me sometimes we talk about these huge numbers and we can miss the individual. So I just want to read an, uh, a letter from. I, I'm, I'm not going to give more details because I've got his full permission. It, 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 this is from the the comments, so it is it is public. So I'll just call him Ronald in England. Um, it is it, if you want to look through it is on the comments. He's put it into the public domain. So thank you, Ronald. Uh, the data you are sharing regarding suicide only went up to December the twentieth, eighteen months old. Uh, correct, Ronald. Um, the Office for National Statistic data is often uh, delaying, of course. My sister and brother-in-law committed suicide in 2020 due to the fact that my sister needed a liver transplant but had been told she wouldn't get one because of COVID. Then another sister died six weeks later because the ambulance driver said she was best staying at home because the hospital was full of COVID cases both in the south of England, and um, this sister died of a blocked bowel, what we'd call a, a gastrointestinal uh, obstruction. So many deaths really due to COVID. So, Ronald, just so sorry for your losses there, but it does also illustrate the, uh, the damage that's been caused by the pandemic, and in some cases the, the overreaction or the over-focus on the virus rather than the totality of, of ill health, which, of course, people suffer and uh, die from all the time. So we're getting some kind of uh, rebalancing now. So there we go. Just leave you with that graphic. Um, we, we notice this line's increasing during Omicron times. So Omicron started when about there. Great increase during Omicron times. So this is the Omicron increase uh, here. And I've no reason to suspect that that is not carried on increasing. And we'll be getting pretty near the, the maximum level now. So very encouraging data in terms of uh, individual mass immunity. I'm not calling it herd immunity because it's not going to go away, but it is a significant factor in the development of endemicity. And it will be the same everywhere. So th this is really, really an encouraging video. So thank you for watching.